Okay, welcome back. We are going to uh, learn again one very important concept, which is the regulation of blood pressure. So what are we talking about? Every person has a set blood pressure. So for instance, if my blood pressure is 110 by 70, this is the systolic number and the diastolic number. This is what my systems are uh, programmed to function with. If there is any increase or decrease in this set homeostatic number, they are going, there are going to be mechanisms in our body that will start to work in order to restore the homeostatic number. So we're going to look at some short-term uh, mechanisms and what do we mean by short-term? These will work very quickly. So the response to the change in blood pressure will take from seconds to minutes. We're going to talk about the bioreceptor reflex, the chemoreceptor, some hormones, epi, nor epi, ANP, and AGH. A little longer term, the RAA simple, will just take a little longer. So these will respond first, and if still there is change in blood pressure, this will be activated. All right, in order to understand how blood pressure works or who controls the heart and the blood vessels, we're going to go back and look at the neural control of those organs. So within the medulla oblongata of the brain, we have the cardiovascular center. It controls the heart and the blood vessels. If you see, this is two parts of the word, cardio, because we're going to look at the cardiac center, vascular, we're going to look at a vasomotor center of the blood vessels. So the cardiac center first, what does it do? It is going to carry nerve impulses to the heart. One branch is the sympathetic. So if there is sympathetic activity from the medulla to the heart, this will increase the heart rate, increase the force of contraction of the ventricles. If there is parasympathetic stimulation, it will do the exact opposite. It will inhibit the heart. So this is the first part of the cardio vascular center. The second part is the vasomotor. So this is the autonomic control of the diameter of the blood vessels. Again, it's in the medulla oblongata and it's going to take nervous impulses towards the blood vessels. If we stimulate the vasomotor center, we will have sympathetic stimulation and vasoconstriction. If we inhibit the vasomotor center, we will end up with vasodilation. This is a combined effect. So just for you to remember, this is the medulla oblongata where I have the cardiovascular center. Some of the impulses will go to the heart and some will go to the blood vessels. So how does the medulla oblongata know which type of impulses to send? It has to receive information from other areas. And this is where we're going to talk about some of those receptors that will detect changes in blood pressure. And accordingly, they will send information to the medulla and the medulla is going to send the proper input towards the heart and the blood vessels. This is a nice um, uh, differentiation between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic activity that comes from the cardiovascular center. I want you to review this and study it very carefully. I'm just going to point to the outcome. If there is sympathetic activity, I will have increase in the cardiac output, 
and increase in the blood pressure. If, on the other hand, the parasympathetic activity takes over, the exact opposite, the outcome will be decrease in the cardiac output and decrease in the blood pressure. All right, let's start talking about those detectors we were talking about. So we're going to start here. We're going to follow those um, receptors. We're going to start with the baroreceptor um, reflex. Now, we're talking about baroreceptors. What do we mean by baroreceptors? Baro means pressure. So I'm talking about a pressure receptor that is going to detect changes in blood pressure. Where are they located? These are my baroreceptors in the aortic arch. These are baroreceptors in the carotid sinus. Every time the ventricle contracts and pushes blood out, there's going to be stretch on the wall of those vessels and the baroreceptors are detecting, is this pressure normal? Is it higher? Is it lower? So baroreceptors are located in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. What are they going to do? Baroreceptors are going to start a reflex if there is abnormal blood pressure. What do I mean by reflex? Receptors will send neural information to the medulla oblongata, and the medulla is going to send information back to the heart and the blood vessels. I call this a reflex. So, change in blood pressure detected by baroreceptors will go to the medulla oblongata, and the medulla will send information back to the heart and blood pressure to change those parameters. This is what we call a reflex. It's a very fast neural circuit. It takes seconds. It is automatic. It is always predicted. Every time a change occurs, the outcome is going to be exactly the same. So let's look at the example of how the baroreceptor works. So. This is my homeostatic normal range of blood pressure. If the blood pressure decreases, immediately the baroreceptors are going to sense this change. They are going to send information to the medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata is going to stimulate the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. This will increase the heart rate, contractility of the ventricle. This will increase the cardiac output. It will send sympathetic stimulation to the vasomotor center, constrict the blood vessels. Those two effects together will increase cardiac output and resistance and will restore the blood pressure back to its normal levels. And remember, the exact opposite. So the baroreceptor reflex will respond to either increase in blood pressure or decrease in blood pressure. And these are exactly the steps and they will be reversed so that the outcome here, if I have an increase in blood pressure, all of those steps will restore the blood pressure back to its norm. If I have low blood pressure, all of those steps will increase the blood pressure, restore it back to its norm. All right, done with the baroreceptors. We're going to look at chemoreceptors from the name. What do I mean by chemoreceptors? These are receptors that are responding to chemical changes in the blood. So what are the most important chemicals in the blood? The level of oxygen, the level of carbon dioxide, and the pH of the blood. Any normal person, we know, will have high levels of oxygen, low levels of carbon dioxide, and the normal pH that is not acidotic. So let's look over here. 
where do we find those chemoreceptors? We're going to find some again very close to where the baroreceptors were. So I have the aortic bodies in the wall of the aorta. I have the carotid bodies in the carotid um, arteries over here. So these are chemoreceptors, and because they're in the heart, we call them peripheral chemoreceptors. They will monitor the level of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and the pH of the blood. But I also have another chemoreceptor. When the blood reaches the brain, it's going to be filtered as cerebrospinal fluid, and there is a chemoreceptor in the brain, in the medulla, that is going to check the cerebrospinal fluid. And if there is any change in the pH, this is my central chemoreceptor because it is in the central nervous system. It will respond again to this change in the pH. All right, so we know where the chemoreceptors are. Now, what do they do? We're going to look at them. Again, they will initiate a chemoreceptor reflex. I have my receptors. They're going to send very quick information to the medulla. The medulla is going to affect, again, the blood vessels and the heart. We learned what we mean by a reflex. I want you to look at those changes. These are three changes that occur together at the same time. Any time there is lowered blood oxygen in the blood, there's going to be increased carbon dioxide, there's going to be low pH or acidosis. So if this happens, decreased parasympathetic effect on the heart will increase the heart rate. Increased sympathetic in the heart will increase the heart rate and the stroke volume. Sympathetic stimulation of my vasomotor center will vasoconstrict the blood vessels. So this is the outcome of increase the heart rate, stroke volume, vasoconstriction. So what am I really doing? Increasing heart rate and stroke volume, cardiac output. I am moving blood quicker away from the heart to the lungs and to the tissues because this is where it can pick up oxygen and get rid of the excess carbon dioxide. And this will bring those parameters back to normal. So these are my chemoreceptors. They will do the effects we just mentioned. And this is the final result. They will speed the return of the blood to the heart and to the lungs so we can pick up oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. The third parameter we're going to talk about is the effect of hormones on um, cardiac output. So the first one is epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are produced by the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is the little gland on top of the kidney. And when we look at the central part or the core part, we call this the adrenal medulla. And the adrenal medulla secretes the two very important hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. When are these produced? Every time there is sympathetic stimulation to the brain and the nerves, information is going to travel very quickly to the adrenal medulla and it will increase its secretion of those two hormones, which will increase the cardiac output exactly like the sympathetic stimulation. Another hormone is A. NP, atrial natriuretic peptide. So if I say atrial, where does it come from? From the atrium. How is it produced? The volume of blood that reaches the atrium will stretch the atrium. So anytime there is increased in the volume of blood in the atrium and I have excess stretch, 
A and P is going to be produced in large amounts. What does it do? A and P goes to the kidneys because I have high blood pressure or high blood volume and I want to get rid of this. Who is the organ that can rid, get rid of excess fluid? The kidneys. And this is exactly what the A and P is going to do. So we're looking at here at A and P secreted by the atrium due to excess volume of fluid or high blood pressure. This is going to go all the way to the kidneys and it will stimulate the kidneys to lose sodium. Remember, every time sodium moves, water follows sodium. So there is less reabsorption of sodium means we will excrete or lose the sodium in the urine and sodium will pull the water out with it. So we get rid of this excess blood volume, the blood pressure will decrease. So I reverse this back to the normal. I had high blood pressure, high blood volume. We have decreased it back to the norm. Another effect of ANP is vasodilation and those two will result in a negative feedback. I have restored the high blood pressure to its normal level. Another hormone we're going to talk about is called the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. All right, let's break this word into two halves. Anti is against, diuresis is loss of fluid in urine. So antidiuretic hormone. This hormone will prevent loss of water or urination. It's produced by the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary gland. When is it released? Just as I told you, if I have low blood pressure or low blood volume, this is going to be sensed by the hypothalamus and the pituitary and high levels of um, ADH are going to be produced and they will conserve the water, restoring the blood pressure back to normal. And the exact opposite is true. So we're looking here. What's my stimulus here? If I have low intake, dehydration, the osmolarity of the blood will increase. The hypothalamus will detect this by the means of osmoreceptors. It will stimulate the posterior pituitary to produce higher levels of ADH. These will go to the kidney, tell the kidney, conserve the water, reabsorb it, don't lose it, I need this fluid, and this will increase the blood pressure back and I will rehydrate my system. And this is the exact opposite will occur if the circumstances were the opposite. All right, we said there is a short term that acts very quickly. And as you can see, those um, different receptors and hormones will really act very quickly in the body. But there's a longer term, which means if there's still abnormal blood pressure, especially low blood pressure, and I need something more to be in effect, we have the RAA system. So what is the RAA system? It stands for all the names of those hormones, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. Who will activate this system? If there is decreased in blood pressure or decreased in blood volume. So let's look what's the first response here. If I have low blood pressure and blood volume, there is less blood reaching the kidneys. Let's learn this word, renal perfusion, less blood flow reaching the kidney. This is going to be sensed by very specialized cells in the kidney called the juxtaglomerular cells. They secrete a substance called renin. 
this is my first important hormone over here. What does renin do? Renin converts a substance called angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. What happens next? Angiotensin 1 will be converted into angiotensin 2. I'll take you through the rest of the story and then we'll look at this side. This is the series of events that I am following. Angiotensin 2 has several effects. What is angiotensin going to do? Number one, it's going to go to all the arteries and cause vasoconstriction. Remember, where is the problem? I have low blood pressure and low blood volume. What do I want to do? I want to restore them back to normal. So angiotensin 2 has direct effect on the arteries. It will cause severe vasoconstriction. Actually, it is the strongest chemical in the body that causes vasoconstriction. Where else does it go? It's going to go to the adrenal cortex. This adrenal gland has an outer area we call the adrenal cortex, and it will stimulate the adrenal cortex to produce a substance called aldosterone. What does aldosterone do? It's going to go to the kidneys and stimulate the kidneys to conserve, reabsorb sodium. And if you remember, every time sodium moves, water follows sodium. So I am conserving water and sodium in the body. This will increase the blood volume, this will increase the blood pressure, and we restore the blood pressure back to normal. Now those two side steps here just to um, explain what we're looking at. Angiotensinogen is produced in the liver. So once I have renin, this is going to be secreted in the blood. When the blood is traveling to the liver, it meets the angiotensinogen and it will change it into angiotensin 1. And then blood again is circulating in my body. When it reaches the lungs, there's going to be uh, a, a chemical substance here called ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme and ACE will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So this is just to tell you what are the sources of those substances. All right, there is one more effect for um, angiotensin 2. We said the first direct effect is going to be vasoconstriction of the arterioles. There is an effect on the adrenal cortex. There is one more effect that we will see clearly on this last slide. Angiotensin 2 stimulates aldosterone, arteriolar vasoconstriction. It will also increase ADH secretion by the posterior pituitary gland, which again will um, retain salt and water and increase the blood pressure. And this concludes our discussion of cardiac output, and thank you very much.